Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is a great way to start a week. Uh, you know, it doesn't get any better than when you have the chairman of the Armed Services Committee saying he wants to kick off a week of discussion and have it here. So I'm, I'm pretty happy this morning. And I want to say thanks to Chairman Thornberry for doing this today, but also for um, becoming such an important leader at this time. Uh, we were just chatting uh, when we were waiting for everybody to gather that um, probably not been a time when the country and the Congress faces more complex issues, security issues, than now. And honestly, the country's fatigued about the military. I mean, they, we've had 12 years of wars, and there are an awful lot of Americans that just want to forget it, and they just don't want to think about it. But, but the point of genuine national leadership is to bring issues of long-term significance to the public debate so that we don't ignore this. And this is a very important time. We're having a huge debate in the Congress right now about the budgets and how much money we should be spending on national defense. Uh, I think Chairman Thornberry, uh, I know this is his view, that the reason he's pushing so hard on the question of acquisition reform is because if we're going to ask more money from the American public for defense, they want to know that the money they are, were already spending is being well spent. And I think we just have to honestly say we've got a lot of reform that we need to bring to the Defense Department to validate our request for a stronger budget. And we do need a stronger budget. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you feel comfortable every night when you look at the daily news, but I don't. And to think that we are drifting without a strategic plan for our long-term defense posture at a time like this is genuinely scary. Now, the chairman has spent the last two months taking the committee down deep to understand the risks and the threats we face all over. And I think it's a tremendous foundation for the markup that's coming, but also for the next two years. Today, he's going to spend some time talking with us about acquisition reform. It is a crucial and central part of his overall strategy and agenda. And I think we're very fortunate to have a man of his uh, character and his leadership perspective leading the committee at this time. So would you please, with your applause, welcome Chairman Mac Thornberry. Thank you, Dr. Hamry, and, and I appreciate those kind words, and I appreciate the chance to be back at CSIS, and also everything that you and this organization does to help inform and educate and guide many of us as we try to think our way through the national security challenges that we face. You know how... Uh, when, you, when you're on an airplane, they're about to close the boarding door, and somebody says, if you're not going to Dallas, this is the time to get off. I, I'm kind of thinking, anybody that's here that thinking this is a Texan about to announce something about the presidency, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> uh, there's another speech that you may have a chance to get to if, if you run, so um, it's okay to, to slip out the back. Um, I, I was here in uh, November 2013 to launch a defense reform project that former Chairman Buck McKeon had asked me to work on. So I thought it made sense to come back here to uh, unveil the first installment of, of where we are. When, when I was here before, I mentioned that nobody that I'd run into thought that everything at the Pentagon was going fine what I more frequently got was a reaction, that uh, eye-rolling reaction that, oh yeah, y'all are going to try that again. It's not going to make much of a difference. And it's absolutely true that change is hard, especially for a military. Which brings me to a, a subject of vital importance, which is trousers. Now, when you talk about defense reform, you probably think about fighters, not fabric. But in 1912, just before World War I, trousers were heavy on the mind of the French Ministry of Defense. 
See, the British had learned from the Boer War that having those bright red coats on tended to make them more of a target, so they switched to khaki. The French, by comparison, still wore blue coats and bright red trousers. The French Minister of War saw an advantage of being slightly less visible on the battlefield and sought to institute the same reform that the British had, had taken on. But a general way to describe the debate would be to say that the French have always held a high regard for fashion. So taking away trousers would be, as a Parisian newspaper wrote, contrary to French taste and military function. And of course, they put taste before function. Uh, one former general even took to a parliamentary hearing screaming that ministers, to ministers that they would never eliminate our red trousers. Well, later on, after a bloody conflict, the French minister of war wrote that the blind and imbecile attachment to the most visible of all colors was to have cruel consequences. So far, we've been fortunate enough not to have had a general scream about the color of military pants in one of our committee hearings, but I do think the French experience is instructive, and as we all know, uh, their reluctance to change in the next war was to have even more serious consequences for their nation. Militaries are traditional by nature. It's part of their strength. It also means that change, even necessary change, can be slow and hard. As Dr. Hamry just referenced, I think one of the reasons that military reform is necessary for us is that under any budget scenario, resources are tight, and we have to make sure that we get more value out of the money we spend. We have to show our colleagues on the Hill and the taxpayers that we're carefully overseeing how their money is used. But I believe an even more critical reason for reform is the need for agility. As, as Dr. Hamry again just referenced, we've had witnesses over the last two months in Congress testify that we face a wider array of national security challenges now than at any point, certainly since World War II and maybe in the history of the country. We know from the headlines that the threats to our safety and well-being are multiplying, and we know from the polls that the public is pretty uneasy about it. Just think for a second, if you will, about what's happened in the last 16 months since I was here to start this reform project. China is pushing out its territory, even building islands on the South China Sea, while our Justice Department has indicted PLA members over their cyber activities. Now, North Korea has been busy in cyber as well, but they shoot off a few missiles from time to time just to keep everybody on edge. U.S. military was sent to Africa as the first response to the Ebola epidemic, and the National Guard in Texas was sent to our border to help cope with tens of thousands of unaccompanied minors that were flooding in from Central America. Russia invaded and annexed Crimea and has pushed far into the Ukraine, threatening the peace of Europe and post-World War II stability, while Putin won't stop talking about where he wants to put his, put his nukes. Terrorists blew up, shot, beheaded, or enslaved innocent people from Copenhagen, Brussels, and Paris, all the way down to Nigeria, across Africa, uh, into South Asia in malls, museums, grocery stores, and even schools. Now that's not to overlook the stunning success of ISIS in establishing a safe haven in Iraq and Syria, drawing thousands of foreign fighters, humiliating the Iraqi army, and spreading its poison throughout a wide region. Nor the fall of the government of Yemen, the source of the most serious threats to our homeland over the last few years, as Iran spreads its influence throughout the Middle East and may be a threshold nuclear state with the blessing of the international community setting off a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Of course, old problems haven't gone away, from Afghanistan and Pakistan to Somalia to Israel and the Palestinians, where there was a seven-week summer offensive in Gaza. Gaza. Meanwhile, several airliners got shot down or disappeared with hundreds of people dying. In short, it's been a difficult time over the last year or so. And the truth is nobody can foresee what's going to happen over the next 16 months. But what we do know is the velocity of change is accelerating and that the unexpected will spring out on us. 
The question is, how well do we or how well can we respond? So, to help us be better prepared for a world of proliferating threats, including those we can't predict, I think we need to have reforms in at least three areas. One is personnel to ensure that we can continue to attract and keep the top quality folks who serve our country. And our committee is looking at the recommendations of the Commission on Military uh, Retirement and Compensation Modernization. And I suspect we're going to try to do at least some of that this year. Second area of reform is organization and overhead, that classic tooth to tail ratio that we all hear about. As the end strength of the services has declined, the bureaucracy in the Pentagon and elsewhere has stayed, uh, as they say, robust. <laughs> so we need to streamline the bureaucracy partly to save money, but partly to streamline the process because every office has an understandable human need to be relevant and make their presence known. And I think there's a good chance we can work with Secretary Carter to do some of that as well. But the third area of reform, which is what I'm really here to talk about, is improving the way we acquire goods and services. The definitive edge that our military enjoys comes from two sources, our people and our technology. And if we lose our technological edge, our troops will lose as well. Our military has got to be both strong and agile and people are going to get tired of me talking about the importance of agility, which is as old as the cavalry. The army that can outmaneuver its foes wins, and that's why every Mongol soldier traveled with three to four horses, and it's why the Germans so valued their panzer formations. Today you see countries like Russia and China trying to outflank us using technology, whether it's deploying carrier-killing missiles or building radar that can detect stealth. And the only defense is to adapt quicker than they do. I don't want to see America outflanked. The hearings and briefings we've had this year point to an eroding American technological superiority. Several factors have contributed to that erosion, including just the general pace of change, our broken budget process, and an acquisition process where we have a hard time getting modern technology fielded in a timely way. Last week, when Secretary Carter testified uh, in front of our committee for the first time as, as secretary, I pulled off my shelf a book that he had edited and, and partially written from 15 years before. As, as you can imagine, it can be a cruel thing to do to somebody to quote their own words uh, uh, to them. But in this case, I think he was right, and I think he's still right, because what he wrote about was that to maintain a technological edge, we have to align our procurement system with market forces, and we have to be the fastest integrator of commercial technology into defense systems. We have unfortunately moved further away from those goals rather than closer to them over the last 15 years. One of the many lessons I've learned from Dr. Hamry is that our unique government industry partnership in the United States has been one of the key factors in our success to becoming and staying a world leader. It's a fundamental strength, but it's also been a persistent problem. So since I was last here 16 months ago, uh, I've spent the time listening. And it hadn't just been me. Uh, many of our committee members on both sides of the aisle, especially Ranking Member Adam Smith, have listened and read and studied not only about how the current system works or doesn't work, but about past reform efforts and how well they have succeeded or not. We've listened to folks in the Pentagon, such as Undersecretary Kendall and the service acquisition executives and the service chiefs. We've listened to industry, including trade associations, companies, and individuals. We've listened to people who have spent years studying the acquisition process, such as authors and academics and folks at the General Accountability Office and the Congressional Research Service. We've listened to former military and Pentagon officials and industry officials. We've listened to people working in the system now, managing programs, trying their best to get, techno to get capability delivered on time and on budget. And we've consulted with people completely removed from the defense acquisition system to learn about best practices that could be incorporated into the system. 
I know this is shocking, but we've even listened to each other uh, because there are members of Congress and staff that, have a, that are, have a tremendous wealth of experience and expertise in these areas. And we've taken all of that input, compiled a database with more than a thousand specific proposals, uh, some of which, as you can imagine, are better than others, more realistic than others, but it's a database that we can continue to mine for, for years to come. Despite the fact that there are a lot of smart, well-intentioned people in this field, I don't think anybody's smart enough to under have all the answers or to understand all of the consequences to any particular change. So on Wednesday of this week, I'm going to introduce in the House a, a bill that will serve as a discussion draft for the first tranche of legislative proposals to improve our acquisition system. And I invite comments and suggestions. Folks are gonna have about a month to do that because our full committee markup of the next year's National Defense Authorization Act will be April 29th. So there will be about a month to make comments. Now, in offering this legislation, I expect at least two reactions. One is it doesn't go far enough. And you know what? That's gonna be exactly right. It's not enough, it doesn't try to be enough, but it's a start. And it's a start that tries to focus on the basics of the acquisition process, our people, the strategy, and the decision-making chain to, to buy goods and services. Another reaction is, uh, well, it does too much. Well, I don't think that's right, but that's why I want to put it out there, because my first rule is like the doctor's first, do no harm. I want to have it out there for several weeks and invite comments. I really think this is the best application I know of that overused metaphor of trying to fix the airplane engine while the airplane is in flight. This plane cannot go off duty and land for several months while we fix the engine. It has to keep flying while we make improvements because we have to defend the country every day. But if we don't try to fix the engine, it's not gonna be able to defend the country. So we have to be able to do both. So in the proposal that I'm going to introduce, I really break down the uh, changes into four categories, people, acquisition strategy, streamline the chain of command, and thin out the regulations and paperwork. And let me just give you a brief summary of each of those. It starts with people. That's our most valuable resource in acquisition, just like it is in defense generally. We would remove some of the obstacles that make it more difficult for top military talent to serve in acquisition. And we make permanent the Defense Acquisition Workforce Development Fund to help make sure that it can be used more effectively. We would also require training on the commercial market, including commercial market research, to help close that gap between industry and government. To be the world's fastest incorporator of commercial technology, there has to be a lot of interaction between industry and government. And so we require there to be mandatory ethics training on that acquisition-related interaction. So it's clear what you can and cannot do. Secondly, on acquisition strategy, we require every program start out with an acquisition strategy. It has to be in writing and it has to be done up front and then updated as needed. Now this strategy would end up consolidating at least six different requirements into that upfront strategy. And it's got to include what is the most appropriate type of contract for this particular acquisition. This is another area where one size clearly does not fit all. It's got to consider whether multi-year is appropriate. It's got to include risk mitigation strategies, just like our combatant commanders have to include risk mitigation strategies for their war plans. We have to have risk mitigation strategies for our acquisition plan. And uh, it's got to consider, consider incentives. So for example, one of the things we want to consider is shared savings on service contracts, which are, not, which are not currently allowed. In the third area, we want to simplify the chain of command for acquisition decisions. So a number of requirements on milestone A and milestone B are going to move from a legal certification to just a decision. 
And as a recovering lawyer, I can attest that the fewer lawyers that are involved in the process, the smoother it's probably going to go. One of the reasons I think we've gotten so bogged down in bureaucracy is that we've tried to paperwork our way all of the risk. Not only can that never work, it creates a situ it slows everything down and creates a situation where no one is responsible and no one is accountable for the success or failure of a program. So this, dra and this draft will raise the dollar thresholds on a number of authorities, such as simplified acquisition, to make it easier for service chiefs, base commanders, and others to just get things done. And we make it clear that the role of the testing community is to test and advise, not to make decisions. Fourth, we thin out regulations and get rid of paperwork. In fact, there are going to be dozens of uh, reporting requirements that are going to be eliminated. Over and over again, I hear that program managers and in industry are forced to manage the process rather than manage the program. GAO just came out with a report y'all may have seen that evaluates the usefulness of a bunch of these certifications that apply to every single program. Some are useful, some you won't be surprised to learn are not. So for example, several years ago, Congress was concerned that several programs were not paying proper attention to corrosion resistance. So what got interpreted by the bureaucracy was that every program had to have a corrosion prevention report, which had to be staffed and written before that program could proceed. It even applied to computer software, not generally known as a high corrosion risk. Now, in truth is DOD is, has recently taken some steps to correct this issue in its latest acquisition regulatory guidance, but this is an example of how the system has gotten so bogged down. As a matter of fact, the best summary of the current system that I heard over the last 16 months was by one of the leaders working in the system every day. The current system is like a bus where the driver is the program manager and he or she is responsible for getting that bus or that program to a certain place on time and on budget. Yet the bus is full of passengers and every passenger has their own steering wheel and their own brake. So that makes the driver's job pretty hard. And when the bus ends up in the ditch, as too often happens, then all those passengers scatter away and climb on another bus. Meanwhile, the driver's left there trying to figure how to get out of the ditch and get back on the road. Well, what we need to do is eliminate those other steering wheels and brakes so there is one decision maker and then we can hold that driver accountable for getting the bus where it needs to be on time and on budget. That's what I hope these proposals move us toward. So finally, let me just mention uh, three other things. There's more to the proposal that I, than I've outlined here. In addition to the changes in law, we're going to uh, uh, make public this week uh, a separate document that is draft report language. And that includes several studies and markers for future legislation. So one, for example, one area where we need a, to do a lot more work is in service contracts. But we're having trouble getting the information we need to, to, to look at that, so we're requiring the department provide us um, additional money, I mean, additional information in that area. And that'll help guide our steps in the future. Second point is part of improving the acquisition process involves changing the way Congress operates. We're also pretty tied to tradition and often difficult to change. But our military cannot be agile without Congress taking steps that allow and even cur and encourage that sort of agility. Third, I agree with those who argue that we have a unique opportunity now to make needed reforms. Few secretaries of defense know the Pentagon better than, have known the Pentagon better than Secretary Carter. He, along with Deputy Secretary Work, Under Secretary Kendall, the service secretaries, and the Joint Chiefs are all committed to reform. They understand that it's essential. That commitment is strong on the Hill as well. 
Chairman McCain and I agree that reform must be one of our top priorities, and we have excellent partners in that effort with Senator Reid and Adam Smith. Many others on our committees are involved as well on a bipartisan basis. So several long-term observers have pointed out to me that never before have all the stars been so favorably aligned where we have the necessity of reform, key people in positions, and a commitment to make it happen. So the point is we can't waste this opportunity. As long as I'm privileged to hold this job, defense reform is going to be a priority, not for its own sake but for the sake of ensuring that our military is as prepared as possible for that wide array of threats we face today and for the unknown security challenges which confront us tomorrow. We will never get all the way there, but we have to move steadily closer to a Department of Defense that is efficient, effective, and accountable with military capability that is both strong and agile. In the Guns of August, Barbara Tuckman writes that the impetus of existing plans is always stronger than the impulse to change. We have to overcome that impetus, and we have to set aside our skepticism. We cannot allow blind attachments or inertia to cause our men and women to suffer cruel consequences, such as have beset the French and other militaries in history. If we're smart and persistent, we can stay on top. For there is much in our country and around the world that depends on whether we're successful. Thanks. Well, Chairman Thornberry, thanks so much for coming back to CSIS. Sure. It's, uh, sure. it's a great privilege for us to be able to host you and to, to listen to this preview of a soon-to-come rollout. It's very exciting. Uh, I, I liked a lot of what I heard. I think a lot of others did, too. Uh, for the benefit of the audience, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Andrew Hunter. I'm director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at, at, uh, here at CSIS and uh, have had the privilege of working uh, in the past for the House Armed Services Committee on acquisition reform. So uh, We shouldn't uh, have let you get away. <laughs> well, I didn't go too far, uh, and obviously this is still an issue that uh, we're tracking closely. I wanted to start out by asking you a few questions, and then uh, once you've had the opportunity to respond to that, uh, we'll open it up to the group here. Um, we have uh, folks with microphones who will come around when that portion of the session comes up uh, for those who have questions. Okay. But let me start out by, uh, start, if you will, at the end. <laughs> I'm curious as to uh, what you see as sort of your ideal or uh, successful outcome for this effort, uh, both in terms of this year's activity, and then uh, I think you've also indicated in the past that this is not maybe a one year, not a one and done exercise. So if you could speak a little bit about what does success look like for this year, and then what might success look like over a five to 10 year type of a time span for this effort? Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. As I say, this is not a one year effort. Uh, nobody is that smart to fix acquisition in a single swoop. And if you try, you're probably gonna make more mistakes than you're gonna help. Uh, so this is just a beginning. And what we try, are trying to do at the beginning is deal with some of the fundamentals. That's why I talk about the essential nature of the acquisition workforce and, and, and some, some uh, tools to help improve that, the acquisition strategy and the chain of command in making decisions about acquisitions, which is, I think, just fundamental. That's where we start. So what I hope, if, if all of this uh, is enacted and all of this uh, works out perfectly, what I hope is that we have a more streamlined chain of command and more accountability that goes with that hmm. chain of command. But again, this is never a destination that you reach. This is just trying to swing back the other way from that pendulum that has gone so far that software has to have a corrosion report staffed and written for it. Uh, you mentioned Senator McCain uh, and his support for this, and the, that uh, also matches, uh, obviously, my understanding and his public reputation of a strong interest in acquisition. 
Uh, but of course, the Senate doesn't always follow the, the uh, will always of, of one person, and uh, not clear that it follows the will, will of even the senators at most points in time. Uh, but how do you see this playing out in the Senate? Uh, what do you, what, how does the picture look to you on that side? Well, I think the, the key place to start is, I, th I think Senator McCain is just as committed to this as we are in the House, and uh, so it's gonna be a major part of, of his efforts. Uh, we have talked about this from day one when each of us were, were chosen uh, for, for these positions, and we are coordinating closely every step of the way. Now, you're right. That doesn't mean the Senate committee is going to have uh, exactly the same language as the House committee. Certainly, uh, both of us will, will go to the, our respective floors, various amendments come and go, and, and, and so we'll have to reconcile all that. But uh, I think there is a tremendous amount of common perspective here, and uh, I, that, that's part of the reason I'm persuaded that those people who say this is fairly rare, especially all those skeptics that say, ah, yeah, I've heard all this stuff before. It is fairly rare to have that commitment on the Senate, the House, and also in, in the department. Mm -hmm. and, and you really do have it this time, and I think it takes that in order to really make the changes, not just at a superficial level, but, but in a deeper cultural level. Uh, but I also think the people who work in the system are hungry for that. I mean, that's, that certainly came across to me in, in the meetings I had with program managers, inside government, industry people. People want to, to do things. They don't want to just fill out useless reports. And so much of their time, effort, and money is spent on paperwork these days. You mentioned, and I, I like the way you framed it, uh, the importance of agil agility in the system. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, a lot of folks have commented, and we've uh, been looking at it here, and on how uh, defense technology and commercial technology and the interplay between the two uh, is, is undergoing significant change. Uh, like you mentioned, the pace of change, um, and, and just sort of the nature of where technology development is happening, both in terms of commercial versus defense and in terms of globally, uh, it being much more global exercise. So uh, as you look down the road a little bit, uh, how do you see that changing the way that the acquisition system needs to operate, uh, both in terms of the laws that you're, you're, you're working on, but then also, uh, you also mentioned the regulations. Yeah, um, well, I think it is, it is just fundamental because we cannot take 20 years to field a new airplane with technology moving at this speed. And, and so that's why streamlining the system is absolutely essential. And, and, and the point about commercial technology being where much of the innovation happens also means we can't, or, or in fewer instances can we start from scratch with the military developing the requirements and, and doing all of the work. There has to be that much greater uh, cooperation and integration of commercial with, with military. And, and so that's part of the, as I mentioned, that's part of the reasons we have the proposals uh, that, that we did. So, uh, but, but I think your point gets to what, what I think it may be even more. Part of what you've got to change here is, is the culture and the incentives. Mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of people who work in the system um, have been criticized for in the past, say, for being too close to industry, so now they have this standoffish sort of, of, of attitude. Too often, the current system uh, rewards people who just take the lowest bidder no matter what and figure we'll work out the rest of the stuff stuff later. So that's part of, of why I think it's important for us to start with these fundamentals. The acquisition strategy where you do the work up front in thinking through what do you need to have a successful acquisition here. Um, and, and then streamline that chain of command so you can hold accountable the people who actually make the decisions without all those other people having their own steering wheels and, and brakes. Um, I think we're gonna have to do that. Uh, or else we really will be left behind in, in not having that technological edge that uh, has, has been key to our success, at least since the end of World War II. And you mentioned industry and, and had a big focus there on the, uh, the criticality of that partnership between government and industry. Uh, industry, of course, uh, 
filled with very patriotic individuals who work hard on these problems because of a sense of mission, but also uh, they're responding to shareholders uh, sure. who have expectations, uh, as, as is reasonable. Uh, so how do you see that dynamic in terms of incentives for not just the folks in industry, but, but their shareholders to make sure that uh, their incentives are fully aligned with what we're trying to do? Well, that, that goes back to the point I quoted from Ash Carter 15 years ago. We have to align our procurement process with market incentives. Uh, because if you're going crossways, it's not going to work. And too often, our incentives may not be crossways right now, but they're not going the same direction. Mm -hmm. So what that requires, I think, is that streamlined process so you can have more accountability. Um, but it also means more innovative sort of contract types. Like I mentioned, shared savings on uh, service contracts, where if you win the contract uh, and you can do it a little cheaper, you can keep part of the savings and the government keeps part of the savings. Versus the way too much of the time it is now, and that is spend all the money in your account, because if you don't, you're going to get less next time. So it's the spend it or lose it sort of incentive. That's going the wrong direction. and and. So, so part of the reason I am insistent this has to be a multi-year effort is that in order to really understand the incentives now and to begin to change them, because that's really what's going to change behavior, it's going to take time. And, and a more streamlined, accountable system is a key first step, but there are many more steps to go in order to have that alignment going in the right direction, in order to be the world's fastest integrator of commercial technology. It's just so complicated, it's gonna take time, and, and, uh, but this is a, hopefully a positive step. Well, at this point, I'd like to open it up to audience questions. I had, I had four on my watch, so it's about time for someone else to get a chance. And uh, we'll start up here with Steve. If you could say your name and where you're from and the microphone's headed your way. Thank you. So, Professor Steve Schooner from the George Washington University. First, let me offer you some kudos. It's wonderful to hear you talk about things like incentives. And it's good to hear you acknowledge some of the cynicism and some of the difficulties for change. But I just want to say before I get to my question that I think that when you talk about reducing the bureaucracy, any focus you have on reducing the cost drivers, those would be permanent changes that would have direct effect on the bottom line. So as you do the big things, don't lose sight of the fact that every one of those you eliminate has a direct benefit to the government. My question, I think, is pretty straightforward. One of the last things Dave Berteau did before he left CSIS in his big number crunching report talked about the fact that since the economy tightened up, the single biggest change in defense acquisition has been the reduction in money spent on research and development, and the most dramatic reduction has been in IR&D, or independent research and development. You talk about maintaining technical superiority. Any thoughts on addressing that gap? Thanks. No, I, I, I share that concern completely. Um, as budgets are tight, you have to pay the fuel bills and the, the, you got to send the paychecks out. So what gets cut? It's the R&D. And that's true from the government side. And then with our broken budget process, what does industry see? They see dysfunction. And so they tend to put less of their own money into it. Um, so uh, as we evaluate the president's budget proposal and, and move toward our own defense authorization bill, I think we will look at some key technologies that are going to be important for our future and seeing if we could do a little better on them. Um, because I do think that is, is very important. I hope where we can get is some more stability in our budget process so that industry says, yeah, I think there's a future there and we're going to put more of our... But, but I have to say, one of the things that concerns me the most, getting back to our uh, discussion, is you know, Lockheed and Northrop are always going to deal with the Department of Defense. A lot of other firms that are doing, that are uh, key innovators can take it or leave it. If it's too much hassle to do business with the Department of Defense, they can leave it. And, and, and so part of the reason to improve the way we contract for goods and services is to make the Department of Defense a little friendlier to do business with so that we can take better advantage of commercial innovation and some of the other companies that, you know, are, are on the fence about whether they want to deal with it or not. Uh, 
here in the back? Oh, on the merit, okay, maritime part, yep. Thank you for your help. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll put it on the radar screen. As I say, don't expect, however, for all problems to be solved in a single swoop. Okay, I see Dave said me back here. David, David Sedney, formerly with the Defense Department. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, over the years, uh, many have criticized the military industrial complex, starting with President Eisenhower, the Iron Triangle, and there's been great efforts to try and insulate uh, the government from the uh, impact of industry, leading to, in the current administration, an almost uh, complete absence of senior executives from various defense and defense-related firms being able to serve in policy-making positions. While there's certainly some benefit, others have said that this removal of expertise, this barring of people uh, who have the kind of expertise in the areas such as procurement that you mentioned from decision-making procedures also means a lot, of a lot of expertise is never able to be used by the government. Uh, what are your views on the ability of uh, uh, the pot potential of senior executives from our uh, military industrial firms being able to go back into government? Yeah, no, this is the reason I mentioned, I think this is one of the areas where the pendulum has swung too far. Um, and, and this is not because of some law that, that Congress has passed. This is, is more regulatory, um, and it, it's gotten worse certainly with this administration. But that's, so, so part of what I think we have to have is this close cooperation of uh, industry and government, and that is gonna include, inevitably, people who move back and forth. Because if you think about it, if you don't let people move back and forth, then who do you end up with? People who, don't, who haven't had experience in what you're dealing with. But, but, so part of the reason I think it's essential to simplify that chain of command is so that you can, there can be more transparency and you can hold people accountable for the decisions they make. And then as I mentioned, we have a requirement for people who are part of the acquisition process to also have ethics training that is, is targeted to these sorts of situations. Now there are ethics classes that are, you know, at, at Defense Acquisition University, all government employees have some, but, but my thought is, uh, Target it for these sorts of interactions, make it more transparent, but understand that that sort of uh, cooperation is just essential, and it includes people who, who will move to different jobs. I have a, I have a hand here in the back that uh, came up early. Well, I, th I think it gets back to the issue we were just talking about. Uh, how can the Department of Defense be the world's fastest integrator of commercial innovation and technology into defense systems? And how can the Department of Defense be a friendlier place for commercial innovators, innovators to interact with? So I think all of that does uh, fit together with the reforms that we're talking about. But, but I do think part of the reason these reforms are so essential is that eroding technological superiority that, that I mentioned that uh, is taking away one of the key strengths that we have had over time. 
And uh, if we sit here and twiddle our thumbs and fill out a bunch of paperwork uh, and it goes, it's, it's going to be really hard to, to recover. Uh, right here in the, just the right. Hello, Congressman. My name is Jennifer Lee Oberhori, and I'm with Northwestern University's Medill National Security Journalism Initiative in Washington. Um, my question pertains to the fourth priority uh, that you mentioned with this proposed legislation about cutting down the paperwork. Um, while I understand that your goal, as I interpreted it, was to keep one program manager accountable instead of having a very confusing uh, amount of bus drivers. Uh, but if, you, if I can indulge your metaphor for a moment, um, my concern is that, say you have this bus and the driver, who would be the program manager, is more used to the administrative roles, and they have the equivalent of being a carpool captain, whereas the people with the excess steering wheels might have a commercial driver's license and would be better suited to run a metro bus. Uh, so to bring it back to the current situation, my question is, if we put the program managers in charge, how are we going to ensure that uh, by, put, by decreasing the people who are subject matter experts in the different aspects of the acquisition process, um, how are we not setting the program managers up to fail, um, and how can we keep those accountability measures in check, even if they don't require a rubber stamp, so that we can be both efficient and effective? Well, um, I think you start out with, with the assumption that somebody's gonna mess up. And it's just gonna happen. These are human beings, complex decisions. Somebody is gonna not be motivated for the right reasons. Somebody's gonna make a mistake. Somebody may be corrupt. You, that is what happens when you get humans involved in decision making. The question is, what, how do you design your system? Do you design your system to eliminate, as best you can, any chance of that happening? Or do you design your system to be as transparent as possible to, make sure, to have the best chance of finding it if someone is incompetent or corrupt? Uh, now, there, there's a difference here. So a simplistic example to me is that you know, Walmart could eliminate shoplifting basically down to zero if they frisk anybody coming in and out of their stores. But obviously that's not in Walmart's best interest. Neither is it in our best interest to have mile after mile of paperwork and reports and requirements and second guessing uh, which have the overall effect on the system of preventing us from fielding modern technology in a timely way just to try to prevent somebody from messing up or somebody from having the wrong motivation or something. So, and, 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 and here's the other, we're partly responsible for this in Congress too. So something goes wrong, we like to haul people up there in front of the TV lights and say, you really messed up and shake our finger and then pass a law to make sure that, you know, back to my analogy, this is not really true, but that every program's gotta have a corrosion report on it. That wasn't what the law said, but you get my point. Uh, we overreact, and, and so we've got to be sure not to overreact. I firmly believe that the simpler the system, the better chance you have for accountability, and the better chance you have to find uh, instances where it hasn't gone as well as you wanted, and to fix them. The more complicated your system is, kind of like Medicare. Medicare is so complicated, it is rife with fraud because there's so many ways to manipulate the system because nobody understands it all, or like the tax code. So the simpler you make it, the more transparent you make it, the less of that you're gonna have, but you can't paperwork or regulate your way out of human frailties. You know, I just want to follow up on that briefly because uh, the GAO's selected acquisition report uh, came out, or their version of their selected acquisition systems, uh, I think about a month ago, it was in the press. And I got a very interesting email from someone in the cost estimation community. And one of GAO's findings was that uh, a little over half of the major weapon systems had experienced cost growth in the preceding year. And the note from the cost estimator said, well, you know, if you're a cost estimator, you do a 50-50 estimate. So half the time it should be, you expect that it'll overrun and half the time it'll underrun. So he was delighted. He said, hey, this is almost, you know, this is about hitting the nail on the head. Uh, but that's not quite how it played out in the press. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. no, that's a great point. So, uh, and here in front.
Morning, Chairman. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. And, uh, very refreshing to hear a lot of the themes that you're talking about. My name is Jason Tama, um, fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I was wondering if you could talk, um, go, going back to the first, how you laid out sort of the case for reform. You mentioned three areas, military personnel, overhead, and acquisitions. Um, I mean, the inertia against change is very powerful, as you said, and change agents like yourself and Secretary Carter have a shelf life, as you know. Um, maybe you don't, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely do. I don't know about him, but I do. Yeah. Um, and the inertia is so powerful uh, from the bureaucracy. So I was pleased to see that people was the first area that you focused on in acquisition reform. And I'm wondering if you can provide a little bit more detail. You mentioned um, removing barriers for top people to get into acquisition reform. I assuming you're talking about on the uniform side, uh, are there any reforms on, on the civilian side as well? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Primarily, uh, what I was referring to there was, was on the uniform side, so that we have a situation now where if you want to go in acquisition, you've got to stay in acquisition, uh, rather than be able to be in acquisition while move to the operational community and, and back, so it limits the pool of people who want to get into acquisition. Now, this is, you, there are arguments on both sides of this debate, and that's part of the reason I want to put this out there for a month and get feedback from it. If you think we're making it worse, you think it's better, you know, uh, I understand there are arguments on both sides. Uh, making sure that people get joint duty credit for being in the acquisition system, for example, a, a variety of things like that to help increase the pool and, and then also support the people who do come into the acquisition uh, system. When you start, start, changing, uh, start changes on the civilian side, you get into a, a, a different set of laws and so forth, and, and we are looking at, at how some of those uh, uh, might, might work. So um, I do think people is, is the key, uh, and, and as I was just referencing, the, what, what do people get rewarded for? What do people get punished for in the system? When it comes to their careers, their upward progression, uh, those are the things you really need to understand to understand whether changes you think you're making are really going to take place, because that's what affects people's day-to-day uh, -day decision making. And, and so, as I say, I'm, I'm not uh, pretending that I understand all of that, but uh, I hope that beginning with uh, opening the pool, uh, using the, defense, the, the uh, Workforce Development Fund on a permanent basis, developing these kinds of increased training for commercial and, and, and ethics things, gets us on a good start for, for further improving the workforce, which has already been improved, I think, from, from what it was few years ago. But no, no plans to do anything on the civilian bureaucracy side? Is it well, we, we may. Uh, I mentioned, it. see that kind of overruns with the second area of reform, which is uh, overhead, which is civilian and military. It's not just civilian. So we, we may well be taking some steps in, in that area, um, but today what I was just trying to focus on is, is the way we contract for goods and services. But, but, but your, your point is exactly right. These things are interrelated. Um, and, and just as the military compensation stuff is related to this, so if you want somebody who can uh, be, be competitive with Google, you want somebody who understands what Google is offering and in integrating that commercial technology, then you're going to have to be competitive for that really top talent which gets us back to the Personnel Commission recommendations. Are, is the government competitive for that top talent? And do their recommendations make it more or less likely that we'll be able to compete with Google for these software engineers in the past? So the point that all of these things do uh, intertwine is absolutely valid. Okay, I think we have time for at least one more, depending on the length. So uh, just here in the back, if we can... Jay Harrison from West Virginia University. Uh, Congressman, thank you for your efforts on behalf of this, this very important activity. Um, obviously, I think we all recognize that change needs to happen. Your comments earlier regarding the barriers that exist within the, within the department uh, regarding the insertion of commercially derived technologies. 
Clearly, the Secretary understands the value of commercial technology, as does uh, Deputy Work, as does Frank Kendall, but all those individuals are going to be out of the department in a couple of years. What can the House do, what can Congress do over the course of the next two years to reinforce an orientation towards leveraging outside innovations, outside technologies? Well, I think we can get it off to a good start. Um, and secondly, we can help educate and, and, and lead the discussion. I think one of the major roles that Congress can play in national security writ large is to help shape the national discussion uh, of, of what's good for the country, especially going into a presidential election year, especially in a time when, according to the polls, uh, national security is either the number one or number two concern of most people. This is a real opportunity for us. Um, and, and, and it's an opportunity for us to, to elevate the discussion and, and to focus on where we are and, and, and the trend. So that's part of the reason, as Dr. Hamry mentioned, we've spent the last two months in our committee focusing on the security environment, on technological trends, uh, and, and where things stand before we start looking at specific budget proposals. And, and, and I think that has made a big difference in all, including me, all opening the eyes of all committee members uh, in understanding where this trend is, where we stand, and, and, and uh, where, it's, where it's headed. Um, you know, nobody can guarantee anything. Um, so I don't know how future elections are gonna go, but uh, as long as I'm privileged to have this job, this is gonna be a major focus for me because if you look back in history, uh, it has been Congress that has been key to major reforms at the department. And Goldwater Nichols, of course, is, is the most famous example, but there are a number of times. Uh, in the first speech I gave since I was chairman, I talked about uh, former Chairman Vincent uh, requiring that some big holes be laid down that became some of the key aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway. We, Congress has been the ones that have made a key difference. If we don't, it's not gonna happen, I guarantee that. So for all the skeptics who are out there saying, oh, this is just you know, gonna be come and go, it's not gonna last, it's not gonna really matter, um, we're gonna do our best to make it matter. La last point is, um, I'm, I'm one of my favorite sayings these days, and I'm sorry I can't remember where it came from, so I'll just borrow it, is the pessimists are usually right, but it's the optimists that change the world. And when it comes to acquisition reform stuff, I really think that applies. Yeah, if, if you wanna be, if, you, if your most important thing is to be right, then, then be negative and skeptical about it. But if you wanna make a difference, then think about what can happen. And that's what we're trying to do, both the House and the Senate, with the leadership at the department right now. You know, time for one more here in the, in the Senate. Chairman Thornberry, thank you so much for your remarks this morning. Uh, I'm Dak Hardwick, the Director of International Affairs at the Aerospace Industries Association. My question to you is about our international allies and partners. As we all know, the U.S. military is not the only user of the defense acquisition system. And I'm curious about how you see our international allies and partners in their role in the acquisition reform to make it easier for them to access the acquisition system for uh, U.S. military uh, industrial stuff going overseas. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I will say over and over again, there's lots of issues that we don't fix uh, with what I'm gonna release this week. One of the issues is the slowness of the bureaucracy to deal with foreign military sales. Uh, when we have uh, customers that are ready to write a check, uh, and yet it's uh, our bureaucracy that um, seems to think it knows better and slows it down or, or puts conditions and makes it more difficult. Increasingly, it, are, it is those foreign military sales that help provide us, the industrial base, to keep technology or keep capability here at home. And so the harder we make it to sell stuff overseas, the more we're hurting ourselves. A whole nother area that we don't 
uh, solve here is the whole intellectual property issue. So, and, and there's a, I say, well, we could, I could recite a, a fair number of issues we don't solve. Um, but I mentioned we've got a database of more than a thousand suggestions. This is a start, and we're going to use that database of suggestions when it comes to these problems uh, in future years. Now, now, some of my colleagues may offer amendments this year. I can't tell you they won't. They certainly can. But as far as I'm concerned, we're going to keep after it uh, for a variety of these issues until we, we try to, um, until we come closer to the kind of system that we all hope and, and, and need um, out of our Department of Defense. Remembering that the bottom line goal is how can you best defend the country? That's what this, that's what this is all about. Well, we, we've come to the end of our hour. Uh, Chairman Thornberry, thank you so much for being here this sure. morning. Uh, it's a really great, uh, a really great start uh, or continuation of the effort and uh, very much look forward to having the legislative language released uh, on Wednesday, I think I heard you say. Uh, and I imagine there'll be lots in the room who'll be interested in giving you some feedback on it. Good. Uh, but uh, good luck in your efforts. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it.